Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Categorically Romance Podcast. My name is Bree, and I'm joined by one of my favorite friends ever. My Chloe is here. I'm like, my Chloe. Hello, That's literally hello. how I feel. Yes. <laughs> welcome. Tell everybody thank about you. yourself. I'm so happy you're here. Well, thank you. Yes. Um, my kids said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm recording with Miss Bree. And they're like, Miss Bree. <laughs> 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 Chloe and I am on YouTube. I my channel name is Always Looked, and um, I kind of dabble in and out of a lot of things. I used to do a lot of vlogs, and I still love doing vlogs. But um, wrap ups, reviews, all sorts of crazy things. Um, primarily on YouTube, and I'm the mom to three little girls, ages five, three, and almost one. And between those two things, that's about it. <laughs> oh my gosh. I can't believe we're almost one. I know. Isn't this it crazy? It's gone so fast, so slow and so fast. That first yeah. year is crazy, but yes. And five, oh. like five is crazy. I cannot believe Ainsley. Like she's going to well, be 17 before we know it. <laughs> I know. And, you know, I started my YouTube channel when I was pregnant with my second kiddo and she's now almost three. And like, I remember, I mean, she, my first two both had to be induced. They would have, they would go back in if, if we let them. And they, I remember there was like baby watch on YouTube because I was just not having this baby. <laughs> and, and now here she is three and Miss Independent and. Your things. wildflower. She's your wildflower. Oh, she is my wildflower. <laughs> <laughs> she is. And I just feel like you, like, you are like my go-to for like women's fic. Like that is your, I think, is it safe to say like it's your fave? Is it your fave? It's my comfort genre, I would say. Like it's where I started reading, I would say. I mean, not started like as a kid, but like as an adult choosing to read outside of school, anything like that, it's like women's fiction is kind of just where I gravitated to and where I just spent my time. And so now it's like, I still um, enjoy stories about women, especially women going through hard times, going through friendships, sisters. I am, I have two sisters. I have three girls. Like the female relationship is just something that fascinates me and um, mother-daughter relationships like I just love kind of examining that um, and so I think that's just kind of where I've where I started and where I still find comfort and sometimes it's nostalgia for me now but um, I would say women's fiction like hard-hitting women's fiction is probably my favorite and then um, I love like chick lit kind of rom-coms and um, then thrillers and domestic thrillers, psychological thrillers, courtroom thrillers. I don't really care. I'll take them all. Yeah. I was thinking, I was like, it's so perfect that you are a girl mom. Cause I just feel oh like those goodness. are like the stories that you oh gravitate towards. Yeah, I guess, you know, we didn't find out with my first kiddo what she was. And in my family, there's almost no mixed gender families. Either you have all girls or you have all boys. And so um, we didn't find out. And so we had her and they're like, it's a girl. And we're like, okay. <laughs> and now I'm a little scared. And now three kids in, I'm a little more scared, but we're going to figure it out. And so maybe, maybe women's fiction is research. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So like, take me back. Like, what is the like, origin story if you had to look back and were, do you feel like there were like seeds planted throughout your life like because I know you're a babysitter's club fan like, I'm a baby is it club that fan. like did it start yes. there well so I maybe I mean because contemporary like kind of um somewhat relatable fiction has been my favorite from the time I could read like babysitter's club um all those kind of things like were very, um, just what I love to read. And then I, my grandma, um, is a big reader and she was really into, um, romance and kind of, and kind of similar things. Um, my mom as well. And then I have a sister who's nine years older than me and her and I, um, are the closest of all my siblings, like obviously not by age, but by relationship. And, as a little kid, I spent a lot of time with her and wanted to do everything she was doing. So as she was reading kind of contemporary women's fiction things, I kind of did that. Um, and that's where I got my books because I, that's just what I had available. And so Debbie McComer, huge, like, and she really toes the line between romance and women's fiction, but 
um, Jane Green. Like I'm, I'm trying to think of all these kind of classic women's fiction authors that were in the early 2000s because I was probably, I mean, I was in 2000, I was 11 years old. So mm -hmm. in those early 2000s, I was really starting to like explore the genre as a tween teen girl. And so I guess it's just mom, grandma, sister, their influences, kind of having that so it's available and just wanting always to be older than I was um, because I'm the youngest of six kids. And so kind of reading about these, you know, starting like Sophie Kinsella, starting with these like young women and kind of following them up. I think it's kind of where it started. Like, what do you tell us what you love about it? Let's start there. I just love um, female relationships. You know, like I said, examining the intricacies because I have, like I said, two sisters and um, our dynamics between the sisters are all very different. And I am just fascinated by female friendship. And there is no bond stronger than a female friend, in my opinion. Um, like I've had guy friends and stuff, but they are just totally different. Um, females, the, you know, females just get each other on a different level and getting to see, um, the ins and outs of that, because we are also very hormonal, um, sometimes volatile individuals um and kind of seeing how how you balance all those things and how um you know you're each other's ride ride or die whether that's your sister your mom your best friend whatever um and getting to see a life that is different than mine but also similar enough that I feel like I can relate or I can learn or I can see pieces of myself in in that character and allow um that to help me grow it is just what I love. Yeah. Well, the the more that you read it, especially having read it for so long, mm -hmm. do you feel like that is a like subgenre of fiction that is evolving? Like, like what yes. keeps you coming back for more? Like what keeps it fresh for you? Yes. Um, well, so it's interesting because I was actually going to ask you if you know about Harlequin's Red Dress Ink line. No. Have you heard of that? Okay, look into it because so long story short, I also have an addiction to um used books <laughs> and used book buying and cheap books. If I can find them, I will buy them. And so I have shelves that I are so old that book they're books that I've probably had 10 or 15 years and um, I'm now trying to go through them and read them. And a lot of them are red dress ink books that I probably bought new. And it is a line that Harlequin had in the early 2000s. I don't know the exact year. Um, it was short, short lived, um, but they are all these women's fiction, kind of rom com, kind of Sophie Kinsella esque um, books that I am loving. And oh so, my gosh. <laughs> um, however, they are very different, I would say, than the women's fiction that is being written today. There's, you know, anybody who's read any anything in the early 2000s knows there's a lot of problematic content as far as weight issues, um, sexuality issues, gender issues, like all those kind of things. You know, I, I feel like women's fiction, because it is so grounded in contemporary relationships, like it has to evolve with the times because relationships are not allowed to be that way and yeah, now. Yeah. And so I think it changes as culture changes, as society changes. Um, and there's just, everybody has a different story. You know, as a kid, I used to love to, like, I loved to travel. Um, obviously I was one of six kids. We didn't get to do it that often, but I, and I still love to travel because I just love people watching and see, and knowing that like, every single person has a story and getting to see that like just a glimpse into that through women's fiction I feel like it'll never get old because everybody's story is so different and yes there are some tropes that are repeated frequently but every woman is different yeah I feel like so for people that don't read romance obviously like romance mm -hmm. has a stigma and then sure. I think even in the world of romance, I feel like some romance <laughs> readers have a stigma against women's fic. Oh, totally. And I'm like, I don't understand why. Is it, is it, is it this idea that like women's fiction is for like an older reader demographic? Like what are some of the assumptions <laughs> that you think people have? Well, what I hear most is that it's boring. And 
I can see that um, because it's often just a window into somebody's life. Now, if we're talking about like the th- – because I think women's fiction is a silly – thing and i mean what is women's fiction i i like even trying to make a list of recommendations i'm like okay is this women's fiction you know i don't know um it's hard it's a hard one to define because is it just about women that women enjoy i don't know but so if we get more into like the domestic thriller domestic drama kind of side i think there's definitely more plot but if you are just in kind of straight women's fiction it's really just looking at people and relationships and so plot may not be there, it may just be following this person in their life. And so I can see why that would not be great for some people. And then there's also the women fiction, women's fiction that is very, um, you know, rom-com chiclet kind of stuff that it is sometimes silly characters being, being superficial, be, you know, those kind of things that is like, I, I guess dumb to people. I don't really know, but what, what I hear primarily is it's just boring. It either needs romance or it needs suspense and not having either of those things makes people uninterested. The most of like most of what you read, do you feel like, I mean, I, I don't think I've read a women's fic that didn't have like a romantic element, you know, it may mm-hmm. be small, but I, I'm like, I don't think I've ever read a story where that wasn't there. Or even if it wasn't romance, like some suspense, like, have, sure. you, have you read anything recently where you're like, guys, it I, I can totally understand because like this didn't have anything else going on? Um, oh, no, I mean, because relationships are like pivotal. And so there's always romantic relationships. But I guess for me, the way I define the difference between romance and women's fiction is if I'm going to tell you what the book is about, am I going to say it's about, you know, Billy and Susie, or am I going to say it's about Susie and Billy's in, you know, on the side, you know, Billy's kind of a part of it. And, or I feel like in um, women's fiction, there are more established relationships, like whether that be marriages, um, long time, long-term relationships, whatever. It's not about necessarily finding love, but I do think that, I mean, a romantic relationship is often involved because a lot of females in the world are attached to people, (laughs) you know, that's kind of the reality of the world. I know a convert. I'm glad you, you mentioned chiclet earlier as like another subgenre you, you read. And like, we used to talk about this a lot, like (sighs) the difference between women's fic, chiclet, and then beach reads. Yeah, are, yeah. Are chiclet and beach reads like an umbrella under women's fiction or or no? I mean, is, I is don't it like know. Women's fiction, the umbrella, <laughs> and then they fall uh. under it. It's so and and like chiclet is is it just like a UK thing? Like, and I know that like yeah. for a lot of people, chiclet is not a nice term. I personally uh-huh. love it. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I, I, I'm just not easily offended by any of that and, and to each their own, you know, if you don't like women's fiction, that's totally fine with me. Um, we all like our different things, but for me, like beach reads too is very subjective because personally I love to read thrillers on the beach because they're fast moving and you know, it's, it just keeps you entertained. Um, but I, Like I think of like Emily Henry as a beach read. And so is she women's fiction? Is she romance? Is she, I wouldn't say she's chiclet or rom-com or any of that because her books do have some heavier elements. So um, I don't know, you know, and I kind of feel like it's a book by book basis of what exactly I would call each thing, but it's really hard to define because there's a lot of crossover. I honestly think that, and this is like a I don't want to say a weird thing for me, but like when I find someone that's talking about something that I feel nobody else has talked about, I'm like, I want to be friends with that person. Uh So when you came on the scene on YouTube, I was like, she's talking about women's fiction. And like, (laughs) nobody was talking about women's fiction. So like, I just thought it was so brave of you. Like you're like, here you are like showing up like loud and proud, like Uh talking about this subgenre. Like, What made you decide, like, what inspired the start of you, like, talking about books in that space? And, like, was there ever any – because I'm sure you took a look around and were like, nobody's talking about this. Yeah, this isn't a thing. Yeah, this (laughs) isn't a thing. Well, I I mean, so why did I start YouTube? Ironically, I started YouTube in 2017, Mm -hmm. um, the same week I found out I was pregnant with my first daughter. 
And the reason I did it was because my sister was on YouTube um, mm-hmm. at the time. And she was talking about buddy reads and she was talking about the social elements of YouTube and I and the people she had met and all of that kind of stuff. And I am an extrovert through and through. And so I was like, well, I want to do that. You know, I missed kind of uh, school book reports and that kind of stuff. And so I like, I want I want a reading assignment. Like, come on, let me, sign me up. And so I did that. And then um, my pregnancy knocked me out. And so I did YouTube for a very brief time and then um, stopped and deleted everything and then came back when I was pregnant with my second kid because I was just deep in mommyhood. You know, I had a one and a half year, you know, my kids are about two years apart. So I had one and a half years old. I'm pregnant, not able to socialize in the ways that I wanted to. And I really missed that community of talking about books. And I went in with the goal of, I'm going to talk about the books that I like. And if it's two people that watch, if it's five people that watch, I don't care how many people watch. Um, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk about the books I'm reading and see the world is huge. See if I can find somebody who who will talk to me about these darn books. Um, so that's kind of what I did. And even now I read such an eclectic uh, group of things that I, I don't expect my channel to ever be huge. And that's, I'll never be in it for that. And I think just kind of keeping realistic expectations that when you talk about things that aren't the most popular, it's, you're going to be kind of a niche channel. Do you have, um, like, are you able to just, you're not really a mood reader. Can you just pick up a book? Yes. Um, yes. I am a mood re- mood reader that likes boundaries. <laughs> um, because <laughs> if Listeners, you could... Chloe is very big on boundaries and knowing Bound- your why. You are my yes. grounding friend. You'll be like, Bree, oh. remember your why. If you yes. don't know it, you need to think about it. <laughs> yes. You know. But um, if you can see the room I'm in, and we have books all over this house between myself and my kids and all of that kind of stuff. And I, if I just had no boundaries, no guidelines, no parameters, it's, it's crippling. And so I like to have either like a, just a general guideline of where I'm going, but with my physical reading, um, I am completely a mood reader. Be- okay. Because I, well, so I separate my unread books between books that I can get copies of digitally and books that I cannot get copies of digitally, whether for free. So through my library, through um, Kindle Unlimited, I guess those are, that's really the only service I pay for. So if I can get it through one of those services, it goes on one shelf. If I cannot, it goes on another shelf. And my physical reading all comes from the shelf that I can't get digital copies of. And so that shelf is smaller. So I feel fine mood reading from that. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I do like some parameters. And you're big on, so, okay. Are you doing the unread shelf read project this year or no, or was that last year? <laughs> no, I'm not. That you're was not last it? year. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, I, I was looking through my emails. Like, I don't even know if she's like hosting it. Yeah. This year. I don't know. But you're big on reading from your shelf. So yes. I mean, are things like lined up a certain way and you're like, I'm going to read this next. I'm going to read this next or like, not at all. No, okay. <laughs> not at all. Not I've at always all. wondered the method to your madness. It, it, there isn't one. Well, so as I haul things, I put them into my computer. So they're on my Goodreads, um, that I own them. Like I have a bookshelf, a shelf on Goodreads that says on my own shelf or on my, on my bookshelf, whatever. I don't know what it's called, but I do that. And if there's like a hold for an audio book or something like that, I'll go ahead and just put it on hold at that time. Because I, I feel like it's such a surprise. Like when it, whenever it finally comes, I'm like, Oh, great. Cool. Yeah. That's a surprise. I didn't expect that. And so, uh, there's always stuff trickling in that way. And as I, like, I, I've been really reading the things that I'm hauling now, which is not helping all the things still sitting on my shelves, but, um, I guess that's kind of how, or I'll just, if I love, like I said, I love vlogging. And so if I can come up with like a, some, something to vlog, um, kind of a themed video, I will do that. But I don't know. I I can't tell you the method to the madness. I feel like vlogs are such like the saving grace if you're like a content creator and a mom, uh, cause it's uh-huh, like, uh-huh. <laughs> it's like, whatever yeah. I can just record us. I don't have, uh-huh. I don't feel the pressure to like 
be fully dressed with makeup and all of that. Right. It's not like a super mm -hmm. fashionable sit down video. It's just, you can just do little clips here and there and then put them all together yeah. and it's magic. Yes. Well, and it's like, I can commit to talking for five minutes. I cannot commit to sitting down and filming a 30 minute video or whatever, because it's just, it's hard to do that and not be interrupted 17,000 times. So yeah, I, I love vlogging and for a while I did it constantly. I mean, I, that's just how I talked about what I was reading is every time I finished something or every time I had something to say, I turned on the camera and made it into a vlog. Um, now with three kids, I'm not able to juggle all that and vlogs do take longer to edit. So I don't do it all the time or quite as often, but it's, it's still, I love watching them and I love making them. What? Like, so as a viewer, and it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be bookish stuff because I know we okay. all go through phases where it's like, I don't want to watch anything bookish. Uh -huh. What if you get on YouTube, you know, tonight before you go to bed, what are, uh -huh. what are you enjoying watching? Well, I, so YouTube, um, I follow a couple of runners because I am also a runner. And so I love watching marathon, either training vlogs or watching, um, running vlogs. I love that especially for courses and um, marathons and things that I've never done. I, I love watching that. Um, bookish stuff. I love watching bookish stuff. And, you know, I, I watch a lot of people who read nothing like me because like if I, if I watch all people that read like me, I start to get overwhelmed with like the number of recommendations. And so I, I watch people for their personality, not necessarily for like the relatability of their content. And then also I, my oldest child is five and we have started homeschooling. And if you homeschool, by golly, you know what a beast that is. There is 40,000 different curriculums all, uh, you know, for every subject <laughs> there's, every, you know, it's, every, it's overwhelming. And so I kind of have fallen down a few different, uh, homeschool rabbit holes, trying to, trying to figure out what will work best for us. So, and again, I found a couple people that I love their personalities. And so I, We'll listen and watch everything. I fell down the homeschool vlog rabbit hole and I really mm -hmm. had no intention of even homeschooling yeah, my yeah. kids. I was just like, this I is know. so cozy. I love it. I know. <laughs> well, and it's so, yes, it's so inspiring too, because anybody who has kids really, I mean, little kids, big kids, I don't care. You know that like <laughs> the 24 hours a day inside your house is probably not always pretty, but these <laughs> vlogs are, they yeah. are pretty and they're inspiring. And these moms are like just doing all the dang things. And I'm like, okay, yeah, if you can do it, I can do it. Does doing like, does creating content as a mom, especially a mom and a wife, like, does it feel like one of the one thing or one of the few things that you do for yourself. Yes. Yes. And especially at this stage in life, when my kids are so little, they, you know, they're, they're very like physically demanding and I don't get much accomplished throughout the day. As far as like, I've got a pile of laundry that's been sitting here for three days. I've got, you know, I've always got dishes to do. I'm most of my day is spent feeding people, cleaning people, <laughs> and mm -hmm. that's about it, you know? And so, um, YouTube is the one thing that these are my people, my, my books, my things that I'm talking about. And it's also productivity because I get to, especially vlogs. Again, I'm tying it back to vlogs cause I love them, but because I will, um, start with an idea, execute the idea, fin you know, edit the idea, finish it, get it out to people and talk about it. And that amount of productivity is something that I don't get anywhere else in my life. And Brie will attest to this. I'm pretty type A and I love- She's such lists. a completionist. I love, <laughs> yes, I love completing things. I love productivity. I love like being able to check boxes. And so it serves a lot of, um, it serves a lot of purposes for me. With women's fic, I know you have like your favorite authors, but like, mm -hmm. are there like buzzwords? Like, you know, cause I, there's sure. always new authors coming out all the time and I'm pretty sure. sure there's some like OGs that maybe you skipped over. Like what are those words that you're like, Oh, 
this is my catnip. I'm picking it up. I don't even need yeah, to read anything yeah, else into it. Sure. Um, well, right now I'm kind of in a like I've heard it called momcom. So like there's like Mommy Tracked by uh, Whitney Gaskell. There's all these books that are about like Bright Sided Disaster by Catherine Center that are all um, they've all got covers and or titles that indicate that they are about motherhood. I just read one called Maternity Leave that are all just about um early motherhood again because it's chaos you got it is chaos <laughs> having a five three and one year old is like chaos and um just having like being able to laugh about it is something that sometimes I need a book to like get me out of my head and get me out of like how many times I've listened to baby shark and you know those kind of <laughs> things like I need a I need a book to get me out of it so right now that's definitely a buzzword and that does cross over to my thriller reading too if there's like baby shoes or if it's even like a kidnapped kid as much as I that's terrifying I love reading about like people in similar life stages so that um, infertility is also another thing adoption like all those aspects of motherhood are major buzzwords for me just because it's I'm I'm really fascinated by how um, the different paths to motherhood the different ways we all do motherhood mm -hmm. and it's just it, it, again, the stories never end because no two stories are the same. When you are picking up a thriller, are you in a specific mood or no? Like you said, you can take, no. like you love thrillers on the beach. Mm -hmm. Like when you go to the beach, you're going to bring a thriller. But like, I don't know, like they, especially when they're good, like they're just so mm -hmm. unput downable. But I feel yeah. like I save them. And I always ask yeah. myself, what are you saving this for exactly? Uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah, so not I it's not by the mood, but I do like because women's fiction too, I feel like is another one that it's like the character is your friend. And so you, with a good friend, you can set down the book or you can not talk for a, a couple weeks and then you can come back and, well not literally a couple weeks, but you can, you know, not talk and then you can talk and then you can just pick right back up. And so when I know that life is going to be super busy, I tend to gravitate at least physically reading towards women's fiction because I know that if I can only read a chapter a day, that'll be okay. I can follow the story. A thriller, I wait until times like this. We're recording here on Memorial Day weekend. And so I know that I've got my husband here for three days. We don't have excessive plans. And so I know that there's a higher likelihood that I'm going to get bigger chunks of time to physically read. And so I will kind of save thrillers for that. But on audio or ebook or something that's like more accessible, I, I'll read them anytime. I swear one of the things that I love so much about you is you are still such a huge physical reader. When are you yeah. physically reading, Chloe? When are you physically <sighs> reading? Well, I know you, these darn kids. Um, right now, mostly, mostly uh, at, at night. So one of the things that my husband and I have done, just because I'm a stay-at-home mom, and so I do 99% of the stuff for my kids. One thing that we have established from the time our first kid was born is that he will do bath time every night that it's av that he's available. So yeah. he used to travel a lot for work, but. Um, he think silver lining of COVID, he doesn't really do that anymore. So most nights he bathes my kids and that is my time to read. I'm normally, you know, with the baby feeding her doing that, something like that, but she's, she's winding down by that time. And so that is the majority of the time when I physically read. Um, yeah. yeah. And then overnight I, I wake up still because my kid still doesn't sleep through the night. And um, so I'll read at that time. And then if I can sneak in any bits, any bits, um, the spring and summer are actually, I get more physical reading in because my kids are significantly better at self-entertaining outside than they are inside, which I think is pretty normal. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm more likely to be able to like sit or rise as I think what busy toddler calls it, but, you know, go sit outside and watch them play and read then in the winter and stuff when we have to be inside. So for that busy mom that may be listening, who's like, mm -hmm. cause uh, have you ever heard of that podcast, the lazy genius? Yes. So she did an episode about how she read more in 2022 than she's ever read in a year. Mm -hmm. And I mean, us as readers, it was all like, yeah, we know. But I mean, it yeah, was yeah, such, yeah. such great advice. She's like, sure. I just looked at my life and I was like, 
when could I fit reading in more? And yeah. she's like, I can listen to an audio book while I'm doing dishes. Mm-hmm. You know, like the stuff yes. that we're like screaming from the top of the yes. rooftops. But like yes. for anybody who maybe didn't hear that podcast, <laughs> what advice, like how does that busy mom get more reading in? Because I think we have to have that thing that's for us. And I think that reading is one of those things that can calm you down, yes. can quiet your mind. It is an escape, whether it's a chapter a night, like you said, mm-hmm. or yep. a couple of chapters. Like, how does she sure. do it? Well, and I mean, like I said, like just this is such a it, it, this can be such an isolating time of life because you are you're kind of stuck in your house with your kids a lot. You know, I mean, we do a lot of play dates. We my kids are in a lot of sports, but we have to be home for nap time and we have to be home for eight o'clock bedtime, and you know, so it's kind of isolating and being able to read gives you somebody to hang out with. And, and like I said, because I am so big into my why and trying to maintain perspective, it helps me do that. But, uh, like you said, different modalities. So if you're into eBooks, get, get the Kindle app. You can have it on a Kindle. You can have it on your iPad. You can have it on your phone. You can have it on whatever device you have and you can read, you know, when you're, waiting on a prescription when you're whatever out of your kid's doctor, which I feel like I've been need a punch card. Um, so eBooks, audiobooks, like I, yeah, I love tasks go so much quicker when I've got my, an earphone in and can do, um, dishes or laundry or whatever while listening to an audiobook. And I have some that I can have just one earphone. So then I can still hear the kids, hear the book, all of that kind of stuff. But also, I think just making sure you give yourself grace and allow yourself to read because your to-do list will always, always, always always be there. Always (laughs) be there. You know, like I said, I've had some laundry sitting here for for most of the weekend. And last night I was like, gosh, I could put the laundry away or I could read an extra chapter. And I chose to read an extra chapter because that fills my cup. And uh, you, you know, I've got a whole new load of laundry to start today. <laughs> so um, I think giving yourself grace to say that it's okay if a couple things don't get done because you're going to take a few minutes for yourself and read a book. I, you know, I think that that goes a long way. And this is going to be like kind of a weird question, but I feel like as time as t- time continues and technology grows, right? Like we have mm-hmm. such easy access to audiobooks. We have such easy, a- I mean, a Kindle is, I don't want to say that it's cheap because they're definitely not, but more yeah. and more people are getting Kindles. Uh, and like you said, you can have it on your phone. You don't even have to buy an actual Kindle. What m- inspires you to still read so much physically? There's just nothing like it for me. And I, I get distracted very, very, very easily. So I don't really read on my phone just because I can't stop. Like I'm going to read a little bit and then I'm going to check Instagram. I'm going to read some or watch some stories or I'm going to read a little bit and oh, no, look, now I'm getting this message or I'm getting this, you know, whatever. I, I struggle with that quite a bit. And so, um, I like to, just hold a book. You know, I can focus and I love seeing where I'm at, like physically in the book and watching the pages kind of turn and just getting lost in those pages. And, you know, I don't know. I, I have found too, just my tip that if I put my Kindle app on infinite scroll, as opposed to turning the page, I read more because I feel like turning the page 45,000 times (laughs) is like every time is an opportunity to get my mind out of the book. And so I don't know, but physical books, like there's just nothing like it. And my hands are busy holding the book and, you know, cause otherwise like I've got one hand holding my phone or whatever, but what do I do? I don't know. And I just, it's obvious to my kids what I'm doing and I just like it so much more. Yeah. Has being a content creator, has it changed your reading? Yes in that I've got like a lot of FOMO about a lot of books. Um, and so I read a lot more. Um, and I just want to, yeah, I want to read all the backlist things because that's what's on my shelf, but I also want to read all the new releases so I can be a part of the conversations and what's, what's going on. So, um, I definitely read a lot more, but as far as, well, and I guess genre wise, I used to say, you know, I'm a hard pass on horror, I'm a hard pass on a lot of different things. And 
Well, not necessarily. I, I wasn't necessarily shut off to a lot of things, but things like Christian fiction and that kind of stuff, I was not a hard pass on. I just didn't really know anything about. And mm-hmm. now I've been exposed to that. Uh, graphic novels are something that I never knew about until YouTube and somewhat recently. And I like, I feel like mi- uh, graphic novels are a really great way of of kind of breaking a slump and, and just the community element of readathons or whatever, you know, read alongs, whatever it is that definitely shapes my reading and book clubs. Uh, I'm a part of a few different book clubs online through YouTube or through people's Patreon or through whatever. And that has like got me out of my box a little bit and, and changed my reading in that way. Yeah. I love that. Especially like the pandemic, It just Mm -hmm. was such a fun way to like feel connected with people. And I was worried. I was like, okay, now people are like, we're going back out in the world. And I I felt like I wasn't seeing many like book club things anymore. Uh And then you posted a video recently about them. And I was like, they're still alive. (laughs) Yes. Well, Amazon has just started book clubs. And so that's been something to explore. And then I also have loved the like somewhat recent somewhat in the past few year trend of like read with Jenna, um, Jenna Bush Hager and read with Reese's book club and all these kind of celebrity book clubs because before it was Oprah and that was about it. And And Oprah's books tended to be a little heavy. Okay. They're they're very (laughs) heavy. Yes. They're very heavy. And now I don't love a lot of like Reese's picks and that kind of stuff, but it's just interesting an interest, another interesting place to get recommendations. And if you put that sticker on it, by golly, a lot of people are going to buy it. And so then that book is going to be discussed. And it's interesting to see kind of what gets picked and why and what people think and what I think. And I, yeah, I like it. Okay. So I want, I want you to get into your Rex, but I have to ask. Okay. Yeah. Do you feel like you have a most read women's fake author? Gosh, well, I did a video on that what was it? Maybe 2020, 2021. Mm -hmm. And it was Debbie McComer. And that's because I have read, like I read her entire Cedar Cove series. I read her because I am a completionist. So y'all, if I start a series, by golly, I'm going to finish it. So, um, and and that woman has put out what, two or three books a year for the past 30 years or whatever it is. So, um, her, but otherwise like Diane Chamberlain, I have read almost everything from her. Jody Pico, I've read almost everything from her. Um, oh, I know you love Jody. I love Jody. I love Jody. Uh, Lisa Genova, I've read everything from her. These the was some of my favorite authors are not the most prolific, and so I've read like all of their backlists. Tracy Garvis Graves, I've read everything from her. Um, so, but like they are all auto by authors for sure. But they, w- I wouldn't have read the most from them because they're just not quite as prolific. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not everybody is Miss Debbie, okay? <laughs> Good no, no. She is she is one of one of a kind, that's for sure. Okay, so tell us what recommendations you have. Okay. This so you asked me for five or six and I have a list of like thirty. So okay. <laughs> um, well, and I think there's a couple authors. So when you asked me for this list, I was thinking summary kind of be treaty, like we talked about what does that mean? I have no idea. But summary women's fiction authors. And I feel like there's a few that I don't even have to name titles, like Ellen Hildebrand, every single book she writes is on Nantucket. Yeah. The majority are in the summer. Not all of them, but the majority are in the summer. Um, she is just like a women's fiction summer author. And Mary Kay Andrews is another one. She she's not my favorite, but um, she does pretty reliable kind of summer women's fiction. Sophie Kinsella is another one that I feel like does a lot of, of summery stuff. Uh, Renee Carlino, she doesn't necessarily do like summery reads, but she definitely does like heavier reads and they're always released in the summer. So I don't know about that, but anyway, so those are just some authors I that I thought of. But... buy a book by her? I feel like I just bought a Renee Carlino book. They're so good. At Walmart. They're so good. <laughs> like I read, there's been one that I've read that was a dud. Um, but the rest I've loved. And you oh, know, I did. Diane... It was before we were strangers. Oh, I love that one. You I do? do okay. That one. Okay. Yes. I'm going to push it up. <laughs> you you know, and side side note, Diane Chamberlain, I would say, is one of my all-time favorite authors. And her she started writing in 1989, which is the year I was born. Oh, my God. And yeah. I'm reading some of those backlist ones. And, you know, they are not 
they're not great. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm, I'm realizing that, you know, I'm, it's okay. Even your favorite authors can have some duds and I can still love them. That's okay. But yeah. Um, okay. So specific Ricks. Well, and there's also a couple of crossover authors that I feel like really, really toe the line between romance and women's fiction, like Denise Hunter, Susan Wiggs, Jill Shalvis, Kristen Higgins, Robin Carr. All of those, I would say, are good women's fiction. Almost all of them have summary books. Um, and they are definitely like <laughs> a gateway into women's fiction. If you're kind of unsure if you like it or if you prefer more romance, I feel like they are a good they have like strong romantic elements and book by book. Some are definitely more romance. Some are definitely more women's fiction. So there's, there's a lot there, but um, okay. So some of my favorites, the unplanned life of Josie Hill by Stephanie eating. That one came out a couple years ago and it's about a woman who is pregnant and her husband, her and her husband are having a hard time. Well, her and her husband are having a hard time. They do. They have like a one last night of like, can we reconcile this and decide? No, we can't because he goes and cheats the next day or something. She oh ends up gosh. pregnant. And so now she's pregnant and single and she goes to the county fair, which y'all I live in kansas <laughs> i live in the midwest the county fair is a big deal it is a big um, deal <laughs> oh my goodness especially yeah in a smaller town the county fair is a big deal and so um i she was going down there because she wants fried food not because she cares about anything else and she runs into two guys that she went to high school with and the three of them become roommates and found family is one of my all-time favorite tropes and the found family element in that book is so strong and again there is some romance but uh it's about this woman kind of coming to terms with she's living with her parents she's like 30 now and pregnant and has this failed marriage and you know love that one it it's so good the found 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 family is what makes that book for me but then we've got The Overdue Life of Amy Byler by Kelly, Kelly Harms. Um, that's another one that I, I think it's set in summer. In my head, it's summer. So if I'm wrong, I'm sorry. But it is about this mom who she's just like in, 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 in fully in mom life. Her kids are teens or tweens or you know, somewhere in that late elementary, I'm not sure what age exactly, but she wants to be a librarian. And so she goes, leaves the kids with her ex-husband and goes to New York and does this like week long um, thing. And she just kind of discovers herself again and love that. I love um, the title of that one. Yes. Yes. Uh, one Italian Summer by Rebecca Searle. I, I think a lot of you guys know um, that one is about a woman who goes to, it to Italy to um, kind of try to connect with her deceased mother or sick mother. I can't remember if she's died or not, but that one is not my favorite, but it is good. It, it's still good. Um, that one's huge. Like I still get emails yes, about that uh -huh. one. And I'm like, yeah. didn't that book come out like a year yeah. ago? <laughs> yeah. And I feel like people have really strong opinions about that one because there is kind of a cheating element. And so, uh, you know, okay. whatever. Okay. The, the, speaking of cheating, like Colleen Hoover is another one of my favorites. And I don't know, uh, her books, I would say her books are more so romance, except for like her thrillers and stuff, but who she's divisive. <laughs> Remember um, we, when we read Verity together? <laughs> yes. I love it. But, the chat in that book club uh -huh. meeting. I'm like, guys, this is one of the best written books I've ever yes, read. It I really know. And Sarah, Sarah just hated it. <laughs> yeah, <she did>. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, yeah, bless her. Um, and then Evie Drake starts over by Linda Holmes. It's uh, about, it, it is more, I would say, well, I don't know. See, this is a one that's like, is it a romance? Is it not? Um, this woman, she's kind of down on her luck. You know, her, I think her marriage is split up. A lot of things, you know, that's kind of a trope of like, life's falling apart and how do you pick it up? Um, but this guy, he was a MLB player and he got the yips. And so he can't play anymore. It's a, it's a shoulder issue, I think. And, um, so it's like baseball kind of baseball is there in the background, which is just summer to me. And I love that one. And then a, a series, uh, Wendy Wax, she's another one that does women's fiction pretty well. And she has a series called 10 B Trode. And it is about, gosh, maybe four women that, uh, renovate this house on 10 beach road. And it's a multi-book series, um, that I feel like it was a, it was a book or two too many, but 10 beach road is really good. I and, love the name of the series. Yes. And same with I heart New York by Lindsay Kelk. Uh, that it's an I heart series and she travels all. Well, she lives in New York, I think. And then 
goes to different places throughout the series. Um, another series that I feel like went on too long, but Lindsay Kelk does great women's fiction. Oh, I remember and that's your Lindsay Kelk <laughs> vlog. Well, because like, I can't stop. <laughs> you're yeah, like, it's, okay, I, this book feels very I'm similar to the last one. I can't stop. I know. <laughs> by golly. Darn it. Um, oh, for a heart, heartbreaker, Firefly Lane by Kristen Hanna. She fire. It's a duology. Don't read the second one. Don't waste your time. Um, I haven't watched. I think it's a Netflix show or something. It and is. I haven't, yeah, I haven't watched it. But Firefly Lane is so good. It's like about these two women and their friendship over thirty years. You know, their friends starting when they're kids, and it's so good. Ugh. And that one is just like the unconditional love of friends. It. I love it. Um, Emily Liebert. I feel like she is kind of like a hidden gem that a lot of people have not, I don't know that I've ever heard anybody say anything about her. And she's got, um, the secrets we keep. That's a summary one about three friends that kind of reunited a lake house. Um, Oh, I love Laura Dave. Yeah. Laura Dave. She recently has been getting kind of some notoriety with some like more thrillery titles, but she has a a history in women's fiction and she has one called the divorce party. And it's like a multi-generational story about, uh, the matriarch and patriarch are getting divorced at the same time that the kid, one of the kids is getting engaged. And there's this, it's like a very communicable, um, divorce and it's a divorce party and it's at the summer and their lake house or beach cottage or something i don't know and it's good um some taylor jenkins read D- taylor jenkins reads she's got maybe in another life that one is summary i think malibu rising of course but that's um maybe more historical and then Catherine Sinner, she's got Happiness for Beginners. Um, Catherine Sinner is another one that, like, I feel like now she's kind of edging more into romance, but uh, she kind of has her roots in women's fiction. Okay. And um, Jane Green, I have mentioned her, but like Jemima J, Beach House, Summer Secrets, those are all um, tread with caution because a lot of them are older, um, early 2000s or early 2010s even, and there's there's she's a british author that just goes there you know she it can be kind of it can be a little problematic at times so yeah and then beth harbison she also does a lot of good women's fiction um and like shoe addicts anonymous i think is is one that i think is in the summer but she's got a lot of great stories so there's an overly extensive list for you I, i love it thank you i always see around this time of year and I may have messaged you about it in the years past, but like Mary Alice Monroe, is that a mom? Mary Alice Monroe. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Is she, she does. just like, is she, cause when you said, as soon as you said Ellen Hild- Hildebrand, I was like, I can think uh-huh. of like five covers and uh-huh. she's another one of those yeah. authors too, that I'm like, I feel uh-huh. like a specific time of year. I see this author's books like completely splayed out at the bookstore. Yeah. Well, and I feel like she's one of those that gets a little bit more of a rep of kind of the old lady women's fiction okay okay. um and and a little bit slower and you know mary Kay andrews is one that i kind of equate with her that they a lot of times there's like a a a suspense element or like a mysterious element not necessarily suspense because that in my head kind of implies darkness but it's almost like tongue-in-cheek uh mystery that is just not my favorite but i don't know okay so is there like any because like on ku one of the subgenres that I, I don't know how I get recommended, but it's like, I, I think it falls, falls under the umbrella of women's fic, but it's like this like divorced women's fiction. Like it, the hero, <laughs> it's a whole subgenre of like, yeah. she just got her husband cheating and now she's going to get divorced. And I'm like, oh goodness, how is this its own thing? Why can't it just I, fall in know. with the rest? <laughs> I, I don't is, know. Like, is there still anything that you, is there still like facets of or pockets of women's fic that you feel like you haven't explored yet like at, as it continues to grow oh gosh that's a good question well so james patterson has like the women's murder club series and that's four women that all like all of them have um jobs that like one's a lawyer one's a um gosh one's like the medical examiner at, they've all got jobs around um helping solve murder crime yeah <laughs> crime things and like and so they they te- in the first book they team up to kind of solve these murders and um 
I think Lisa Gardner does some like that. Like there are some that are kind of like <laughs> women banding together to solve crimes or, or I- exact revenge on people and that, and, you know, kind of like the collective or mm-hmm. um, any of those books that have been coming out lately. And I feel like that is a genre that I have not gotten that into. Uh, I, I prefer more like, I don't know, domestic thriller, domestic thriller. Yeah. yeah then kind of the solving crimes kind of thing but i i feel like i could dive deep in fact i that women's murder club series was at my half price books and so i got the first eight for three dollars each and so i i need to read more in that series yeah. but just that genre in general i feel like well i meant to ask like your your more. love of used books but i mean you said half mm-hmm. price books and i'm like yep those prices you just can't beat them sometimes <laughs> well you know half price but bu- half price books is a little rich for my blood <laughs> talking about I'm talking about the library book sale that I went to last weekend that I got an entire box of books for $21 oh my gosh like and it, it I had two of my kids with me but the the younger two with me and I was like guys <laughs> we're doing two the books it, well it's you or the books I can't carry everything yeah. <laughs> so we're all gonna need to learn to walk real quick <laughs> because I can't do it um but yeah, we did some damage and that it, it was, yeah, our library has a, a pretty nice like friends of the library uh, bookstore that's open all the time and paperbacks are a dollar and hardbacks are $2. So that, that gets me. Yeah. And Pango, you guys, the invention of Pango bookstore is painful to my wallet, but <laughs> it's a great, it's a great resource and thrift books and book outlet and all those kind of places and thrift books gets me every time because I'll get on there to get like something kind of obscure for my kids that either we're going to use for school or that one of them is really into. And it's like, you got to spend that money for free shipping. So then I'm like, okay, what do I need? And then the thrift books deals and you know, and then they'll I'll randomly be like, oh, this book is free because you have points. And it's like, yep. of course mm-hmm. I have points. And of course just, I'm going to use know, it. <laughs> it's just like Starbucks. I don't even like their coffee, but the dang star system got me good. It's like, <laughs> oh, I can get double stars if I order today. Okay. Let me go get some overpriced burnt coffee. <laughs> so, okay. I promise I'm, I'm going to let you off of here. But before yeah, I do... Yeah. What is your Debbie Maycomber gateway drug of choice? Someone's never read her. What should they pick up first? Christmas. Wait until Christmas and pick up some Debbie Christmas. Yeah. That's what I would say. She's so she good does Christmas. Christmas so good. Mary and Bright. I love that, that was, one. Oh my God. It's, that is like one, one of my rereads. Yes. I know. Yes. And I just I actually just filmed my June anticipated releases and there's so many good ones coming out not necessarily by debbie but like a lot, susan mallory's got one susan wiggs has one so like all these like gateway authors i feel like if you want if you're wanting to get into Kristen higgins like all of these are coming out with new ones and so you don't have to go far to kind of toe the line into women's fiction yeah yeah and i i still need to read her cedar co series i actually i really yeah. want to get all of the books but they're kind of hard to they're find they're hard to find they are you know cuz i i read them all um probably through the library because before i started youtube i was like my sister was kind of a book hoarder and i was like i don't understand the need to own books i just <laughs> don't like you've got this library why do you need to own them and then i i think youtube is to blame as well as covid because our library is closed forever. And so now I'm like, gosh, I need all the books because what if that happens again? But, um, yeah, so I read them all and then tried to own them all and they're hard to find, but just actually recently people, um, have been recommending that I read the Rose Harbor series. I love that Um, one. Yes. And I've heard nothing but good things and it's only five books. And so that's a lot more manageable. Cedar Cove is gosh, what, 12, 18. I don't know. It's the, those, I, I have to be really selective now with like those kind of long, long running, running romance. series. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, I am such a completionist and I mean, it's hard to do anything good for that many books, but yeah. So maybe Rose Harbor, although I haven't read it, so I can't, I can't tell Chloe, you for sure. But... You're going to love it. I feel like you're going to love it. <laughs> I know I've got the first, I, oh, I've got like three out of the five on my shelf. So I need to pick them up soon. I can't wait. Well, you have to keep me posted. You know I will. (laughs) Well, tell everybody where they can keep up with you online. 
Yes. Um, well, so primarily YouTube. I, like I said, my channel name is Always Booked, and I am on Instagram, um, but I use it mostly for personal and very infrequently. Basically, I'm an Instagram lurker. I'm not not a poster. I'm a lurker. <laughs> she posts um, some really fun mom stories and stuff oh, like that. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes it, you know, it's like this just has to be shared. But I also am um, very, very good about doing Goodreads reviews. So you following are, me on Goodreads is something that I, well, and I do it for my own memory, honestly, not even to talk about books because I hate the platform for like talking about books. But um, yeah, for my own memory. So Goodreads, YouTube, um, Instagram, Pango Books. I, I have been trying to sell anything that's for me, either uh, like three star or lower, I try to sell, which is like just anything I don't think I'll reread. So, um, and I like I, I this is not an ad for Pingo Books, but I feel like that's just like the a, a book club that you can just swap books with your favorite creators, your favorite whatever. Um, so I've been loving it, but yeah, that's it. Well, thank you for this. Thank you for hanging thank out you. with me this weekend. I, I love, love you, Bree. you so much. <laughs> I am tempted to call my kids in and let them say bye, but I, oh I don't know gosh. that we want to open that clamshell. <laughs> I think they're out there. I, I would probably cry. Screaming, I just so. love hearing your little voices. I know. They, well, and my five-year-old is just me, me reincarnated. And so she would sit here and say, oh, is it my turn? Yeah. She, <laughs> she just, would definitely have recommendations. On. She would. Oh. <laughs> Oh, she has a book journal that she, cause she can read now. And so she films reviews. I've got a, an iMovie uh, video that is, she thinks is on YouTube, but it's not, but, um, that she talks about reviews of all of her books. Oh so my she's, gosh. And do you remember some of my old vlogs, uh, that like Ainsley would be in the background yes. with her little toys pretending to vlog? <laughs> yes. I'm like, oh gosh, maybe I need to stop. That's their generation though. Like Kaysen is so determined oh to become goodness. a YouTuber. And I'm like, no, you're oh, seven. My goodness. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, that's it. Like I, yeah, it's crazy. I have to report uh, YouTube, YouTube earnings. And so our accountant is like, you do what? Like, yeah. I mean, clearly well, I'm big time. You are, you are. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, listeners, make sure you check the show notes. I'll have links to all the places you can keep up with my fave, Chloe. Yes, I love you. I love you. Thank you for everybody that's listening. I hope if you do uh, come over to YouTube, leave me a comment and let me know just so I can know where you came from. Bye.